Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'll be giving a lightning talk about EX Lograd, which is uh, a logger backend that can help you to debug where a GUI uh, log viewer. Uh, quick introduction. My name is Lo Xun. Uh, uh, you can see my about page on that, via that link. I'm a software engineer at CCP Games, uh, working on EVE Online. And I currently work in Iceland. Uh, this is a picture of me uh, standing in a crazy Iceland wind. Uh, I go by the handle of Aquahead on GitHub, Twitter, Slack, everywhere else. Uh, <coughs> uh, so we develop EVE Online. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the game. It is a player-driven sci-fi sandbox. Uh, it's an MMORPG. Um, we have been operating the game for 14 years, and it's still counting. Uh, <coughs> we have uh, some amazing achievements. We have the most uh, peak players in a single battle, which is more than like 5,000 people in a single battlefield. battlefield. Uh, we have the most costly battle ever, uh, so in a single battle, uh, which lasts around 22 hours, we destroyed about uh, $300,000, so uh, real, real money. <coughs> uh, so that's about the game. If you're interested, we will be very happy if you join us. But uh, today I'll be talking about uh, the development of EVE Online. Uh, EVE Online has a very huge code base, uh, and we write it mostly in a very legacy Python because when we started, there isn't Python, uh, Python 1.0 even. So we have our own like import mechanism, uh, all, all sorts of crazy stuff. So uh, we we group uh, game features into services. It's kind of like microservice style, uh, but although they are not very micro. So uh, <coughs> as you know, like uh, a, lot of, a lot of events happen during the game. So uh, when developing all the uh, features, we have lots of uh, debug information. And even more when you really start up a server because you have all the uh, services combined. So we need a better way to search, filter, and uh, read of the logs generated from all the services. Uh, that's why we come up with uh, EVE Log Lite. Uh, this is an uh, open source uh, uh, GUI log viewer. It's actually our third generation uh, of the GUI log viewer. Uh, it looks like this. So uh, you see all the message, message here. And then you can fill, uh, search by whatever you want. It also have some fancy features like uh, filters by uh, channels and whatever. But basically, it's just uh, view logs in a GUI. Uh, <coughs> and uh, because I, I, at my day job, I develop EVE Online, and I use uh, EVE Log like a lot. So I was thinking about how can we use it in uh, Elixir development as well. So that's why I come up with uh, EX Log Lite, which is a logger backend for EVE Log, uh, EVE Log Lite. And it's also packaged on Hex, Hex so you can use it directly. Uh, and I'll just uh, give you a live demo of how, how it works. So, uh, so without a QA log viewer, when we start up uh, application, especially if we, we enable the SASO logs, you can see there are a lot of logs generated even we I didn't do anything. So if like imagine if one of these is an arrow, you have to scroll up all the way and trying to find what is the arrow. So that's why we, we need a, a QA log viewer to help you find and filter all the logs. So it's very easy. You just uh, import the dependency, uh, import this package in your mix. And then you configure the, the logger. Uh, this is all standard uh, Elixir config. And then if you, now if you run the application again, you will see all the logs will be in the QA log viewer and click on any of them, you can see the message in the bottom. So this is all uh, the actual log message in that log. And also, uh, it has some uh, fancy features that can see the paid of uh, the process. 
you're you are sending uh, and all the stuff. So basically, this is uh, the EX loglet and stuff. Uh, yeah, that's my lightning talk. Thanks. <laughs> That's about. Uh, yeah, uh, I also wrote a blog post uh, which I described what I learned about pattern matching and binary building uh, when I developed the EX Loglet. So you can check it out if you want. My name is Tulo. I'm the guy who presented last year uh, the multiplier massive online Minesweeper uh, with Phoenix. You have there in, on GitHub. Um, I'm going to present you. Today, another game I've done for, for this conference. Uh, I have my own company, but I used to work with another company called BlueTap, uh, and we do boring stuff for banks and telcos and those boring things with computers. Uh, but, I, but we love making games, and we do Fretless. It's a musical game where you play a, a real virtual instrument, virtual, uh, well, an instrument. <laughs> uh, it's amazing playing it, because you can do your, your vibratos and, well, that's my promo. Uh, and now I'm talking about Q Wars. That's a game I've, I've done. Uh, I released it this morning on Google. <laughs> yeah, on the app store. It's coming soon, sorry, for the Apple people. And uh, you can try the game here. Uh, you can go there, and there is a link to the beta, to the beta app store page, because it's not in production at, at the moment. The game is very simple. You have a word, you have a board, and you have to swipe your finger to find that word. When you finish, it goes, and then you have another board. Um, what did it have to do with Elixir? Well, making it multiplayer. So two guys place the same word and on the same board. Uh, the two of them are playing the same, and the first who finished the, the word gets a point. So you see everything the other guy is doing, the other guy sees you, and then, well, I've won. Yeah. Well, why using Elixir for for this part of the of the game? Yeah. Concurrency. Of course, due to the nature of the of processes being being sequential, uh, it solves a lot of problems for free. Uh, suppose two guys go into a lobby to play and you have to give one match. There's there's a a, a guy at the lobby and there the, there comes two other guys. So there can be a problem with concurrency, and it solves due to, to, to the sequentially of messages. OTP, of course, I've used application, gen servers, agents, everything. Scalability and distribution, well, I want to get rich with, rich with this, and I need a lot of people playing. Uh, let me show you briefly the map of processes. Uh, there is some main application called QWords Engine. There is a lobby, uh, a lot of dictionaries to play with, um, games. As you can see, there is an application, a gen server, supervisors. Um, we need an interface to communicate with this. There is another application called QWords in Keyword Interface, uh, and we have a cowboy server and WebSocket clients. What happens when, when someone goes, goes here to play? Uh, there goes through the server to a WebSocket. There is a WebSocket per client. It goes to, to the lobby and say, hello, I'm here. I'm speaking Spanish, for, for example. And then when other guy comes, there is a match. The lobby creates a game, and then the processes, the WebSocket processes, connects themselves through the game. And the game broadcasts messages from messages to, to, the, to the clients. Uh, let me show you that lines of code screenshot. As you can see, there are more lines of style sheets than lines of Elixir. It's very easy to do in Elixir this kind of stuff. Uh, so that's why I've done this in Elixir. And this is keywords. That's me. Thank you very much. OK, you can put your timer away. I've conveniently put one in the top, top corner for you. Um, I just need to wait for this to load. <laughs> kind of like a nightmare every now. I don't even have a Mac. That's just a picture. So, uh, wow. Okay, things are loaded. So let's talk about writing an HTTP adapter for Phoenix channels. Um, HTTP two short overview. That's it. 
Um, it's binary instead of textual. It's multiplex. So there's one connection and multiple streams over the connection. Uh, the connection's persistent as well, and uh, it can be bidirectional. And it's these last two properties that make it appropriate for writing a Phoenix uh, transport. So in Erlang, there's some support for HTTP2. Uh, we have Cowboy2, which uh, on the master branch and release candidate, uh, both support Cowboy2, uh, both support HTTP2. And uh, they have graceful fallback as well. So if the client doesn't support H2, then it'll fall back to HTTP 1.1. Uh, and also WebSockets are supporting Cowboy, um, as opposed to the other example, which is Chatterbox, which is HTTP 2 only. And it has like a big state machine that handles all the connection, and it uses it for both the server and the client. Um, in Elixir, well, with Cowboy 2, it works with Plug. Um, there was a fork by uh, Andrew Nesbitt, who's potato salad on GitHub. And I pretty much ripped off his code and moved into a library, uh, which is available there. So you can use that with Phoenix, and it works. Um, and it's just got some changes to, to support the Cowboy 2 API. And uh, because it works with that, it also works with Phoenix, um, as long as you use a custom handler. So in your Phoenix config, you can specify the handler you're using. And if you use the custom handler, then the WebSockets will work as well with Phoenix. Uh, a transport is um, like the bidirectional communication mechanism that Phoenix uses for Phoenix PubSub. And by default, we have WebSockets and long polling. Uh, and to implement a transport, it's a behavior with uh, two, well, one function. It used to be two, but now you just need to implement default config. So if we look at some code, um, I've only included this. This is the entry point. And the important part is this line here, which tells Cowboy that it's a streaming reply. Uh, so it doesn't reply straight away. It um, will you know, keep it open until you tell it to close. Uh, so if you look at the actual transport itself, uh, we have this module, um, Phoenix Transport HTTP2. And uh, the way it works is you connect first off uh, with this transport.connect function. And uh, I've only included the code for the success case because the rest is all error handling that isn't super relevant. Um, and if there's an ID on the socket, we connect to the user's channel so we can send messages straight to the user. And then we ent enter a loop. Uh, the interesting thing about the state here is that both the channels and channels inverse are stored. So this is optimized for lookup in either direction. Uh, and if we look at the loop, all this code is pretty much just to make a unique ref so you can get a message for Cowboy. And the bit where we actually communicate with Cowboy is here. We send a message saying that we want to read the body. Uh, and we'll, we send the ref that we want to use. Uh, the last argument here is the timeout. So we set it to 30 seconds. It's 60 by default. So we need something lower than that. And then we enter a receive loop. Uh, and there are two forms of request body, which is the message that comes from Cowboy. There's the fin and no fin versions. Uh, if it's a no fin, then we continue to loop. But in other, the other, both cases, we just handle the message that's come in. So this is the message that's coming from the client to the server. Uh, and the, in the other direction, we've got a message that comes from Phoenix PubSub, which is a socket push message. Uh, and in this case, we want to format a reply and send it back down to over the connection. Uh, and in any other case, we continue in the loop. So when we receive a message, we want to check what the message is. And then we use transport.dispatch to um, get the result. And it handles everything internally. And there are four things that can happen. Either it's a no reply, in which case you just return the state. Uh, it's a reply, in which case you want to uh, serialize the data and send it down um, to the client. It's a joined. Uh, where you do the same as the above, but there's this put here that will uh, add the channel to the state. So that's the user subscribing. Uh, and there's an error, in which case you want to tell the user there's been some error. Um, and yeah, if when we send the message um, back down, we use cowboy request stream body with no fin because we haven't finished yet, and that will send the data to the client. So um, if we look at a demo here, I don't have a live demo because I'm not that brave. But here's an animated GIF that you can look at. Um, we, well, I'll, I'll talk through it the next time it loops. You can watch. It's nice. So we start a PID. We start a stream. Uh, and then we join a channel. And then we get some output, which is saying you've joined. And then we send a message. If you look in the browser, you'll see a message come from HP2. I'll give you one more loop, because so, if you blink, you might miss it. So here it is. There, right there. So if you're paying attention, you'll notice that the top client wasn't a, wasn't a browser. Does it work in the browser? No, but I don't have time to explain because I wasted those 15 seconds at the start in the loading animation. Hiya. OK, so, um, so Tokame is a, a layer for uh, Elixir applications. It's a web layer. Um, I mean, we have one of those already, but I'm going to tell you about this one instead. Uh, so the goals of Tokame are simplicity and to be more than MVC. Um, in reality, this means uh, it's focusing on the web layer only. So it's 
perhaps a, like a Sinatra for Elixir would be a very crude way to think about it. So goals of simplicity. So this is what a server looks like to my mind. You get a request, you want to make a response, and that's done by a server. So the, uh, the code in Tokame for that would look like, OK, have a request in a state, and you get a response. So in this case, uh, simple means pure. There's pluses, there's negatives to this. We definitely don't have time to delve into them right now, but there, are, there is a blog I've written on why I've investigated this further. So more than MVC. So we support all of these, uh, these model layers because we support uh, none of them. Uh, you're on your own. It's, it's your application. Uh, it's, it's a web layer. It, it doesn't give you this. Um, so this is, I think, sort of the future of, uh, well, some of these, I think, are the future of Elixir applications because some of them are better suited to leveraging some of the superpowers we have on the beam. Uh, my personal favorite is memory image. Uh, look that up. Martin Fowler has an article on that. I think that's very cool. So yeah, so it's bring your own model. So it's a, it's a view controller framework if you want. So it's concise. So this is an entire application. So you can have a, a single file application. It's, um, th this still works in the structure of a mixed project. But you have, um, so yeah, so at the top you have a root. So that's the index root. Roots are defined as the segments in the path. Um, for a get request to that root, we return hello world with an OK response. Uh, the second bit, the start, makes it, a, um, makes it an application. So this, this will start up. This is everything you need. You know, if that's as simple as your application needs to be, then that's as simple as it should be to write it. Uh, so, yeah, so there's a cowboy adapter available. Um, Ace in the thing here is a web server I've been working on. You don't need to use that. It, it meshes into more sort of established, <laughs> a much more established uh, web server. So modular, that's another thing we want. So use Tokame, which we had at the top of the uh, app here, is equivalent to using all of these things below. So this is, everything's implemented as middleware, and then there's a few extra helpers for stuff like flash and redirection. Uh, it's OTP friendly. So this is uh, another thing. It doesn't, it doesn't change the structure of a mixed project. So if you have a supervision tree here, you start you know, three applications. You've got a web front end, an API, an admin. They can all start in the same supervision tree if that's what you want. And you know, one by one, you can move them out and migrate onto microservices as you wish. Like, you can do microservices in the beam or microservices outside of the beam, and you know it all works just as simply. So helpful. Obviously, if it wasn't helpful, it's probably not worth recommending. So this is just a view to some of the helpers. So roots can have names. You can then generate a path from those names. Uh, roots can also have parameters, so you can match on a user's ID, etc., like that. It's got flash messaging. Uh, it's incredibly simple, so that makes testing incredibly easy. Like, there's nothing. There's no setup here. There's no helpers for testing. You create a request. If you want to check that the get request to the index is that, you just check those two bits, put it in, and check the response. Nothing more. Uh, the routing DSL goes a bit further. So yeah, here's a few more examples. So it matches on paths and then on methods. It's opinionated. That's an opinion I, I added there. Um, you have a second argument if you need information to configuration. So you can, you can do, essentially, dependency injection or the equivalent of. So error handling is another feature. So this just groups errors together. So if you return instead of a response, an error, you can handle that in one place. Useful if you're doing nested controllers or nested routing. You just have one 404 page. And uh, I think that's about, well, I don't know. That's the last slide. So this is where you can find it on Hexdocs. Uh, Hexdocs are amazing, so go straight there. It's, uh, it's better than the README. Like, the modules are brilliant. I've focused on documentation. Uh, I'm crowd hailer on the internet, so that's GitHub and Twitter. Um, that's me, yeah. Uh, my name is Matt Woodman. Uh, so I started a project to help get uh, integration and acceptance testing working in, uh, in Elixir, because it's something that uh, I found actually to be a uh, pretty significant need. Uh, there is another project that kind of started it before me. Uh, if you've used it before, it's called Whitebread. Um, so <coughs> the main problem with, uh, that I found with this project was simply that it tried to basically reinvent uh, a testing framework all on its own. And uh, so Whenever I needed to like do something before or after the test, it would have to I'd have to use uh, the hooks that he provided, and and uh, so that became really difficult to actually like uh, 
do things like, I just want to run this one integration test, or I'm trying to debug something, or, or whatnot. Um, and so, like, all these PRs and, and issues were keep getting opened up, and it just came to be really, really, uh, really quite problematic. Uh, so I, I actually uh, submitted a PR for him to kind of change some of the DSL, but he actually decided, like, he didn't want it, and he's rather, I started my own project, so that's what I did. And what I did is I built, uh, on top of XUnit, a, uh, a project that will basically read your feature files and translate them into XUnit tests for you so that you can have kind of the best of both worlds because uh, we like the XUnit tests, but uh, you know some maybe testers or other, or other people who are less te technical prefer the feature files. Um, so basically what it does is you have your feature file and you just tell it, where the file is, and then you can use all your regular uh, X unit uh, stuff set up and, and whatnot to do whatever it is that you need. You define your givens, ands, whens, et cetera. Uh, and then you can take out of the regular expressions here, you can take uh, uh, variables out, and then you have your state over here that you can pattern match on. Oh, sorry. How's that? Sorry, there we go. Um, so, so basically, you define those things that match, uh, you know, lines in your f in your feature and your scenarios, and uh, it just generates the test for you, which is basically equivalent to something like like this, which is how we would prefer to to write our integration tests. Um, uh, for most part, uh, it's still kind of uh, in some development. There's still a couple features that are missing, and uh, I'm actually looking for help if anybody's looking at getting interested in a. Uh, in a small project, um, looking for, for anyone who uh, wants to help out with it. Um, it's, uh, for the most part, functional, but has a limited set of features, so that's it. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm John Waba. Uh, I work at a company called Twitch. We do live streaming. It's a lot of fun stuff there. Uh, but, so I'm going to talk about uh, Elixir streams and video. Uh, one thing that I've read about in a lot of blog posts is that Elixir is not great for things that are very data intensive, like, say, video transcoding. So let's just use FFmpeg for that. Um, but <laughs> in fact, uh, what I used to do is we had uh, basically two daemons to manage streaming videos directly to Twitch uh, that were stored locally or uh, on S3. One of the daemons were in Ruby because it's pleasant to write business logic in Ruby. And the other da daemon was a Golang one because it was pleasant to write concurrent logic in Golang. Notice that the pleasantness doesn't go across language boundaries. So now what I do is I do the same thing except write both in Elixir. So a uh, couple challenges. You can't just load everything into memory because uh, the videos are often over 10 gigabytes. So you really want to make sure that you're streaming things. Uh, and you can't know everything that will play ahead of time because some of the videos don't exist yet. One of the parts of the Twitch platform, for example, is uh, users can clip uh, videos in the middle of a, uh, of a stream. And we want to be able to inject those in later just to give them a shout out and attribution. And finally, uh, don't go down because re-ingesting is painful and you don't want that to happen. And dead air is bad. So. Uh, let's talk about a playlist. It's just a basic agent. That's a queue. We have right now uh, the standard uh, video of the bunny.ts. Uh, just set it up so that we have a normal video there. Uh, that'll be a nice sample video to play into. Uh, finally, we have a queue that we just pop and push from. Uh, let's talk about the stream runner itself. Uh, here we just instantiate a link to that. Obviously, please supervise your processes. Uh, and then we call stream.repeatedly, which allows us to just constantly call on a, uh, basically a generator function that uh, allows us to create, uh, to pull up the next video. And in our case, we will pull from the agent uh, if it has something. Otherwise, we'll put a be right back screen and add something to the playlist over here in playlist.push. Uh, finally, uh, you'll notice porcelain over here. Porcelain is a very nice wrapper that I highly recommend for Erlang ports. It makes things more elixirish uh, in a lot of ways. So, uh, and then at the uh, at the very end, if you uh, if you if you can notice, there's just streams throughout the whole thing. So we take uh, we take four uh, things from the queue just just because we don't want to be here forever, and uh, we concatenate them. 
uh, and also uh, we truncate the file because, again, just for the purposes of the demo. So let's run the demo, uh, pull that up, and then run that. So it's right now getting the videos, and then it'll open it up and play five seconds of the, uh, the, the classic bunny video, followed by be right back screen simulating some sort of weird uh, 404 that we didn't find the file that we needed. Uh, and then we'll do another uh, round of that just to show that we've re-enqueued everything. So as you can tell, maybe not, not entirely uh, all in Elixir for transcoding, but uh, definitely uh, very useful for orchestration and uh, solves uh, the problem of being very concurrent, which is handy for things like this, and also being pleasant to write business logic in. Uh, also, uh, just for fun, uh, here's how to stream to Twitch from uh, FFmpeg. Uh, you can copy those flags down for later use. A uh, couple of to-dos. Uh, in the demo, I didn't do this, but what you should, uh, I, instead of streaming from a local file, you'd probably want to use HTTP Poison or HTTP Potion to uh, take a S3 signed URL and stream that uh, directly into the, s the stream flow. And finally, if you are trying to stream to multiple channels or multiple RTMP endpoints at once, you could use the bro uh, GenStage Broadcast Dispatcher to help support that uh, sort of on the fly. Thanks, that's my GitHub. I'm Lee. Okay, good. Um, don't sing a lot of karaoke, so I'm not used to this. Um, so I'm Lee. Um, my talk, just for a short thing, will be on interop between other Erlang-based languages or Erlang VM-based languages. And kind of my experiences over the last years um, with kind of cultural shifts between the various languages and how to go about it. So just as a race of just random hands, uh, how many of you came to Elixir through Erlang? Oh, more than usual. OK, cool. <laughs> um, so you guys can take a nap. Um, everybody else, uh, just some behaviors and stuff that I've noticed. Um, so uh, who's seen this phrase before? This is good, but. Nobody on pull request? OK, Jose tends to say this when you pitch a bad idea. And it's a very pleasant way, because he explains uh, why, you know, this is a great thing. It's not. But um, the value that you get out of that is you learn where the faults in your logic are. And sometimes it, there's a back and forth, and you end up with a much better solution. And there's this kind of concept, and I don't even know what to call it, but the Beam community, which is basically languages built on top of the Erlang VM. So Elixir is an obvious one. Erlang is an obvious one. There's also LFE. And in my opinion, they're, they are very separate languages with different behaviors that while you're coding your business logic, you look at your business logic in very different ways. But they all expose the VM in a unique way. Erlang is not the correct way of exposing the VM to you. It is a way. Elixir's actually a, a direct response to that uh, with knowledge from the web. And LFE is a list interpretation of how to interact with this VM. And we all know what the capabilities of the VM are, but our day-to-day -day is to express that in some form of language. And what is not always apparent is not all Erlang libraries are on hex. They just aren't. Like a lot of Erlangers don't need it. Like just they just add it to their repo and they're off and running. Or LFE is actually very hex friendly. But we tend not to look, or at least not as frequently, outside um, of our safe space to uh, solve our problems. And uh, over time, I increasingly, increasingly have to work with interop for the various things I work on. And I'm, this is just how to frame the dialogue of that. So in, um, when I'm working on interop, um, I might have to, I can't just go on hex and be like, look up rabbit adapter. You'll get three of them, I think. And one will be the official rabbit adapter. Then there is a couple of wrapper layers in Elixir. But there's actually quite a few Erlang adapters out there. Um, 
if you find Martin, where I don't know where he is, but uh, he works at Shopgun. They wrote a very nice one called Turtle. But that's not on Hex at all. It's just on GitHub. So part of your search process when you're looking at Erlang is you kind of have to search around, like possibly IRC, mailing list, blah, blah, to see what libraries are out there. Because every library has some value from being out in production and you've learned lessons. And in some libraries, they're not very Elixir or LFE friendly because they're not using it, they're like, especially if they're not on hex or anything. So, you know, it might not, rebar might not be configured in a way that's friendly for you to compile and all that. And you can't even tilt at the stupid thing because it's maddening and frustrating because it's not outside of how you normally communicate about code. So, uh, put a funny image because it's required. So, um, what I found with doing that is kind of Jose's solution. This is good, but, and you send an email out. And usually, um, even like the Erlang OTP team will, you know, during business hours, send an email back and you can have a very friendly dialogue on what is problematic about Elixir and you come to an aimable solution. Um, and both sides win on that. And I just think we need to do more of that as just a community. Now, mind you, I've been sitting, this is kind of a sounding chamber for Elixir things, but just, I, I, uh, how do I word this? Uh, it would be uh, just have, framing the dialogue in all of our solutions or separate solutions in the Erlang VM are uh, valid, but we want to work together rather than this is how we would solve it in Elixir. Uh, this is how we solve it in LFE or anything to that effect. And there's a good library um, to look at for that purpose. So if you go to HTTP Poison, it's built on top of Hackney. But if you go to Eduardo, who is the man who writes it, uh, file, he also writes, it was on the team that writes Hackney, him and Benoit. And if you look at HTTP Poison, you'll see where Elixir starts adding value than just using raw Hackney. But you can also see, if you look at Hackney, where there's some value there for just access point in um, Erlang, straight. So we're going, okay. So anyway, that's a great library to look at. I'm kind of running low on time because I got a little lost, uh, but that's fine. So um, this is usually the resolution of its good but when uh, Jose merges your pull request. And just some, um, Rule, things to think about. Just talk to the developers of various other languages to interrupt with them. Don't rewrite their code or just don't take like some Lisp code and shove it in Elixir with your own Lisp-like process. Like try to build wrappers so that we communicate as a larger community because we all will see different things. And that's all, really. And uh, I work with I Want My Name. Uh, tagline for today is giving community space. We're a domain registrar and we do things in Elixir, Erlang, and a variety of other languages. And I'm done. Thank you. Okay, hello. Um, I'm going to talk about SQL Dust. Um, my name is Paul Engel. Uh, I'm a developer at Betty Blocks uh, Dutch startup. Uh, I write code in Ruby, JavaScript, and Elixir. Um, I'm also no stranger to uh, uh, SQL, and I've written a lot of uh, open source uh, libraries during the years. Uh, so Betty Bo Blocks, um, it's a platform in, in which we can um, build uh, web applications without coding, so it's a drag and drop interface. Um, currently we are gradually uh, migrating from Ruby to Elixir. Um, the platform itself requires a lot of meta pro pro programming um, because, uh, well, it's everything is dynamic. Uh, the the database structure, so models, properties. Uh, you can also add uh, actions, which are sort sort of uh, procedures uh, which you can drag and drop within an interface. Um, we have uh, created a uh, certain uh, packages. Uh, such as uh, the compiler cache, um, in order to, uh, uh, well, cache generated AST, um, and then run it uh, whenever a request comes in. Um, also, uh, for query, uh, uh, querying data, uh, the requirements are, uh, well, loading data based on a variable uh, database schema, 
which a an, uh, an user of the uh, platform can well um, decide for itself uh, what kind of tables and columns uh, he has. Um, so we have to support selecting and filtering uh, nested data. And also those filters need to be combined. Um, so at first, uh, we looked at ectofragments. Um, well, our uh, Elixir uh, experience wasn't that great. So um, at first, uh, generating uh, complex queries uh, was pretty hard due to the DSL. Um, you have to pin uh, variables. Um, uh, joining tables is also cumbersome, and uh, because you also always have to um, uh, specify how to join uh, a certain table, um, so it didn't seem pretty possible to uh, to use ectofragments for Betty blocks. Uh, so we introduced SQL Dust. Uh, we stopped thinking about table aliases, uh, but thinking in paths uh, associations based on a, a base model. Um, so, and also we don't have to instruct how to join the uh, table every time we need it in within our query. So, um, yeah. Uh, at, at default, uh, SQL Dust uses the standard uh, naming conventions uh, for uh, belongs to when a uh, association is in a singular form, then it, uh, well, assumes that you have a belongs to um, association. When it's in plural, then it's in uh, uh, has many form. Um, and I'm going to show you um, well the difference between fragments and SQL dust. Um, at first, um, this is a simple query with um, ecto fragments. Uh, the SQL dust uh, equivalent is is this one, which is pretty much the same. Um, going to the second query, um, this is a little bit more complex. Uh, you see uh, that you have to use, uh, uh, well, aliases for the tables, of course, and uh, you have to specify how to join the uh, the, the comments, uh, well, the posts uh, um, association. Um, and this is the SQL Dust variant. So. Within here, you say, uh, well, I want, would like to have comments uh, where the, the post ID, post dot ID, uh, is, well, a certain variable value. Um, and in here, you see that you don't have to specify your join of, uh, of the table. Uh, this is another m bit more complex um, uh, example um, with the SQL Dust um, well, equivalent. Uh, in here, you have a, uh, again, you, you don't have to specify how to join the table. You just have to say, uh, well, um, I want to, to uh, group concat the comments dot commenters. And based on the actor model, you have already defined what the, uh, the relation is between those models. Uh, SQL does just, um, well, reads the, the uh, definition and then it determines how to join the um, well the tables. Um, as I don't have much time, I think I'm gonna sh uh, show you how to uh, how it uh, looks like when it generates the code. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so um, yeah, I don't have a screen in front of me. So. Um, Okay, uh, so uh, this is the, um, as you can see, um, here you have a generated query uh, generated uh, based on the SQL dust. Uh, I didn't define uh, the, the join. Uh, those were the same examples which I uh, showed you just uh, in the keynote. Um, but this is the resulting query. Um, and, you know, I don't have much time, so uh, well, um, maybe <laughs> let me show. So, uh, if you are interest, interested in SQL Dust, uh, please to go to GitHub.com um, under the Betty Blocks account, and then, uh, well, you can look f further. 
uh, or you can contact me. Um, this is my handle. Thank you. Hello. So I'm Thibaut from France, and I have no idea what I'm doing with this, so beware. Uh, I wanted to get a feel how uh, Elixir or tree loading works, and uh, so I did a bit of experimentation. Uh, I'm going to go quite quickly on the code because my time is limited, but everything is on the GitHub re repository with a YouTube uh, screencast as well. Okay. So I wondered how to understand what how the the simplest bit of Elixir code which allows to r reload at uh, at runtime, like not a whole ex uh, a whole application, but really a small tiny bit of code. So uh, I wanted to get a feel of uh, how it works. And uh, as well, I tried to make it interesting, so I, I tried to figure out uh, a subject, and I came out with a live sound generation, which means basically I wanted to be able to edit the code which generates the MIDI events uh, to produce some sound. So it's going to be, st uh, it sounds awful, but I want to, you to have faith in the future and imagine that we can do something pretty with it. So first, how to generate one note there is a, you can take a, a proper music production system, which support MIDI events. Then you have a C library, call it Port MIDI, which luckily we can bind with Elixir because someone did the hard work. So we can talk to Renoise or another music production system toward an Elixir uh, library. And it looks like that, so you just uh, connect to a device uh, via its name. It gives you an Elixir PID because it's a process. And then you send message to the music process and then it sends the event to the MIDI driver, okay? And if we want to send a note, we use a certain message with a uh, hexadecimal code uh, 90. And if you want to stop it, it's 80. And you pass the velocity and the note. So that's for the music generation part. Now, how you build a music loop, you can leverage gen server to build a loop and uh, create a timer which will tick every 50 milliseconds. Okay, so I'll go, s I'll go quickly on that, but I open the device and I create a loop which will start itself again by recursion, uh, completely leveraging uh, gen server. Okay, and then in that loop, we can send event to the device that we opened it just before. Okay, and we can uh, implement some logic, like uh, which note should I send now, etc., based on the current tick of the music. Now, how do I reload that? Because I want to be able to save and restart during uh, runtime. So I found code eval file, and I re the gen server. And I had that uh, watching the file system too with AXFS watch. So I reload the code dynamically each time the file change, right? Sorry, it's a bit fast. And I had a ha moment, uh, which is that the gen server reloading keeps its state across reload when the code change. So the current tick of the music is kept, so the state is kept, but the version of the code change, which means that I can edit the code which generates the music event, and it will pick exactly where it was in the past. Okay, so in short, reloadable code, preserved state, and I send it to a MIDI device and Renoise. And now I'm going to make a demo that won't work, right? It might work. Okay. Okay, yes, it's, he has to turn off that or yeah. plug in. I'm gonna plug in the audio here and see if it works. Yeah, I think you'd have to, we have to turn on the mirroring displays here, so yeah, if you go into uh, your settings, your uh, yeah, and click on arrangement, and click on mirror. Okay, thank you so much.
fade out because uh, it's dull. Thank you, that's done. <laughs> Uh, I would like to debunk one myth that previous uh, speaker talk uh, told uh, told you about that Erlang developers are not sharing the libraries on HexPM. I would like to show you a tool that we built together with um, our my colleagues in AppliScale. It's called Xprof. It's basically a tracing uh, tool that helps you identify performance issue. It's a visual profiler based on tracing. We are using it in production. Um, for a huge Erlang app with a huge offload, and basically it's safe to use. Uh, we guarantee that it will be uh, useful. If you would like to, uh, if you would like to use that, feel free to go to the HexPM. Recently re uh, released the 1.2 1 uh, version, which uh, has Elixir as a first-class citizen. What does it mean to have uh, Elixir as a first-class citizen? We are basically having the uh, support for HexPM, but also we are having Elixir flavored match spec syntax. So we are able to use Elixir syntax to actually do tracing inside the UI. It will be hard to do because I cannot, I can barely see it, but that's the, that's the tool and I will try to type in blindly Right now, it, de it detected that I'm using Elixir project that showed the prompt. Uh, and basically, I've got in the background a Phoenix app that is running, and I'm trying to, and I am sending requests to that in order to uh, have some data here. So let's do a tracing and see uh, the graphs. So I'm basically searching for my create inside the registry. This method is basically a, a post, um, post HTTP call that is executed as a, a gen server call. And you are seeing graphs right now, which is, uh, I believe, 99th percentile counts mean and min. Um, yeah, mean and minimum value. Uh, you can enable other percentiles and, uh, and median. And I will do a quick switch and enable another benchmark to show that actually we've got a performance issue uh, inside our code. Uh, it's not a problem with application, it's not a problem with the business logic, it's just me being dumb uh, and I inserted a sleep uh, inside the uh, handle call just to visualize actually the problems and uh, how you can use that tool to trace errors and problem and for performance issues. Uh, also, there's an additional, uh, additional feature which allows you to capture the uh, traces, individual ones, which are, for example, above a tre uh, certain threshold. So you can uh, specify amount of milliseconds and, for example, uh, 10 traces. After that, it will catch them and print responses and uh, corresponding bits, arguments, and call time. Uh, as I said, it's pretty much battle tested and uh, verified in production, so we can uh, guarantee that it, uh, it will not break your app if you add it to a release. And actually, that's, why, uh, that's how we are using it. Basically, we are including it into our production releases. Uh, so basically, you are packaging it with your app and then uh, starting it as an application. If you will go to the localhost 78990, uh, it basically shows you the UI. Uh, if you have any ideas, improvements, we are uh, more than happy to uh, cooperate with you and uh, accept the pull requests or uh, feedback. So we would love to have more people using XProf and uh, Trace, actually. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to hear with you. Uh, I am sponsored by Zendesk. I am working at Zendesk. Uh, today, I will uh, show you how uh, we can handle uh, errors in Elixir. 
Uh, firstly, I will talk about uh, error handling techniques in Elixir, and I will uh, give a tip about a bank operator, and I will take your questions. So uh, there are a couple of ways of handling errors in Elixir. Uh, the first one is the well-known, I think, the let it crash. And uh, then we can use try rescue and after blocks. Uh, we can use try catch blocks. We can trap exit signals, and uh, we can use information tuples with conditionals. And uh, we can use a uh, railway oriented programming using with clause. Uh, it comes with Elixir 1.2, and we can use pattern matching in function level. Firstly, uh, should we let it crash, really? Should we cause uh, this kind of exploit? This is real, and uh, in, in 1996, Arium 5 flight really crashed like this because of a software bug. So when we should let it crash? The purpose of let it crash is a fresh restart. So sometimes we need to restart our computers. Why? Because sometimes memory loads, sometimes uh, some, uh, our computer freezes. This uh, kind of things uh, force us to uh, restart our computer. The similar station is in the uh, Elixir and Erlang. So if we need a fresh start, generally we shouldn't save the state and reload the application. You can consider it like a restart in our computer. Sometimes uh, we need to save data, sometimes we don't need to save data. And we should ask this question to yourself. Is restarting our process uh, helps us to solve our problem or not? Uh, I can give a sample, but it depends on your uh, uh, requirements. Sometimes if we get a DB connection error and we can crash it, on in function, we can restart it. So uh, I have a pattern. If something is retrievable, we can uh, crash it. So uh, in Elixir, we can uh, rise errors, then catch these errors, or uh, rescue these errors. There are a couple of ways to rise an error. A simple one is the rise keyword. We can use rise keyword and then put uh, some uh, message into it as an argument, and then uh, rise an error. We can uh, specify the type of our error and put our message, or you can create your own error type and then Rise it. So after we rise the errors, we can rescue them using a rescue block. And then in rescue block, we are able to uh, pattern match the error type. For example, in this er example, uh, in keyword uh, method, fetch method, uh, if it rise, and it will give a key, key error. And then we can uh, match this error. Also, in uh, file read error, we, we can get file error. On our sum sample model, we can create our own error type, and then we can rise and rescue in the pattern matching. And uh, there is also an after keyword we can use. Uh, if you want to execute on both all conditions, like if you want to, if, if it doesn't crash, we can also use after keyword. If it crash also, we can use the after keyword. So this means that this after block we run in both cases. True catch uh, is not a common approach, but you can even catch the exit signals you are use, using try catch blocks. Uh, in try catch, uh, you can get the value of the throwout one. And uh, in just gen server, we can trap exit signals. Uh, to do this, uh, we need to implement uh, init function and then uh, pass this uh, block process flag trap exit true. And inside your model, uh, you should uh, cache the exit signal and then uh, implement the terminate state. And the last way of the uh, handling errors is error tuples. So we can return error tuples to handle errors. Simply what we can do is if our function uh, returns an error tuple, we can uh, match it using the if condition or case count condition. But uh, for simple checks, this is good. But in uh, Elixir, there is no return statement. So if you want to deeply nest uh, if else statements, that will not gonna be a good uh, coding experiment. So for simple things, we can do if else or case count. But for nested things, it will gonna be an ugly code at the end. So what we can do is we can use a railway-oriented programming. 
What does this mean is, uh, for example, uh, we want to uh, log in a user and we want to make uh, sure that couple of requirements, like this user exists and password is correct, email confirmation and one-time password is valid and inserting session to the database. Any of them uh, gives an error, we should result with an error to the user. What we can do is we can check the email exists, then move it to the result immediately and show the result to the user. How we can do this? So there are two ways of doing this in Elixir. We can use with clauses. It's very easy. It pattern matches with the result of the function. If it matches, it executes the next block. If it gives an error, it moves to a else block. So in an example, firstly, we want to fetch the user by an email. If this one returns an OK end user, and then we are executing the next block. So the next block is pass password match. We can use the data uh, from the first block, the user element, and then we can pass through the next one. If any of these uh, functions gives an uh, error tuple, it automatically goes to the S block. And the other way is uh, pattern matching on function level and pipes. Let's see. So what we can do is, this for the similar situation, uh, we can firstly validate email exists like this clean code, and then, uh, but in this case, we need to implement an error tuple of every function. So how this works? For example, if the first function returns an error and options, the next one automatically match the error and options and will return the error and options. So at the end, we will get an error and options, and we can show this to the user. So the bank operator, uh, it's a, not a rule, but what I can see from the uh, Elixir codes on the GitHub, uh, in Elixir, generally functions has two forms, without bank and with bank. So uh, if you are using function with bank, uh, this means that you should, uh, but it's not a rule, I am just saying, uh, you should raise an error. But if you are not using a bank function, you just returning a tuple, okay, result or error or something. So we can uh, use a simple library called bank to implement this easily. For example, if we have a, a module called uh, other module, and then it has a function do something, if you want to wrap this function and then add an extra uh, rise function into it, we can use band description to handle this. I have a blog post about this, maybe some of you read, and uh, I can recommend you to uh, Go to tutorial uh, error handling from Elixir School. Also, uh, watch the Rob's talk about functional programming and uh, railway oriented programming in uh, F sharp. It's a similar concept, uh, but it's in uh, F sharp. Thank you. If you have questions. <laughs>